The following program is brought to you by the faithful friends and partners of Gregory Dickow Ministries. What upsets him is that we miss the purpose for which we were born. What upsets God is not your sins don't upset God. He paid for those. Your mistakes don't upset God. He already paid for those. You falling short does not upset God. He already paid for those. What God, what moves God, what disappoints God, what, 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 what hits him where it hurts is when we miss the mark of what we were born for and we were born to worship him. We were created to worship and adore the God of who, who created us, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Welcome back to The Power to Change Today. And today we're going to go into part two of the end of religion. Remember what we talked about last week? You see, God wants us to react and respond to his love and his grace. Remember Romans chapter two, verse four says, for it is the loving kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's not our, it's not our repentance. It's not our ritual. It's not our religion that leads us to God's kindness. It's God's kindness that causes us to change. It's God's kindness that causes us to thank him. It's God's goodness that causes us to praise him and to worship him. When we focus on the goodness of God and the gifts that he's freely given to us, man, it causes this reflex, this natural reaction of real worship, real thanks, and, and really the real Christian life flows out of seeing God for who he really is. Check this out. What makes God angry, what disappoints God, what makes him, what upsets him is that we perish. What upsets him is that we miss the purpose for which we were born. What upsets God is not your sins don't upset God. He paid for those. Your mistakes don't upset God. He already paid for those. You falling short does not upset God. He already paid for those. What God, what moves God, what disappoints God, what 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 hits him where it hurts is when we miss the mark of what we were born for and we were born to worship him. We were created to worship and adore the God of who, who created us, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. Asaph in Psalm chapter 73 said he struggled with the age old question. And look at Psalm 73, verse 16 and 17. He, he struggled with this question that we all maybe struggle, have struggled with at one time or another. Why did the wicked prosper? Why did the wicked prosper? But notice what he said. If you put up the New King James version of this Bible in verse 17, when I thought or verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. He said, when I thought how to understand why did the wicked prosper and sometimes the righteous don't. And he said, when I when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Verse 17, until I went, look at until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood. Now, he says, then I understood their end. But the point is, is when I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood. Then I understood when you go into the sanctuary of God, then you understand when you worship God. That's when you begin to understand. You begin to understand your purpose. You begin to understand your destiny. You begin to understand that it's temp other people's success without God is temporary. But with God, it's forever with God. It's eternal. When you go into the sanctuary, he said, when I went into the sanctuary, then I understood. Then I understood when you come to worship. That's when you're going to understand when you come into a church like this, where we worship God, where we listen to his word where we where we sit at his feet. That's when you're going to understand what life is all about. That's when you're going to understand what you're created for. That's when you're going to understand. He said, I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood. Amen. Then I understood. Worship and praise and thanks. We learned our reflex to the goodness of God, the grace of God, having a right concept of God. We know that the word thanks means the giving of thanks for God's grace. The word thanks comes from the word Eucharist, Eucharist. It means thanks for God's grace. It means thank you for your grace. Thanks for your generosity, God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your 
unmerited love and favor. Thanks. And we went over examples. I'm just trying to catch us all up. We need to hear this over and over again. Peter fell to his knees when he saw the great catch of fish. The one leper that was cleansed fell to his knees when he saw that he was cleansed. The man who was demon possessed fell to his knees when he saw that the demons had rushed over the cliff in the form of the pigs. The wise men fell at his feet when they saw Jesus in the manger. It's when you see the goodness of God. So you see worship to crumble, to fall flat, to be ruined for any other life happens when we see who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And so if we will focus on who he is and what he's done for us, we lose our focus. We, you know how when you went on your phone you, or on, I don't know what, cam, how, what cameras do this nowadays, but when you zoom in on one thing, everything else behind it is, un, it's not focus. It's just the thing you're focused on, just the thing you zoom in on is focused and everything else is sort of foggy and unclear, right? That's what it's like. We got to stop focusing on the peripheral thing. Stop focusing on the background of life and start focusing on the one who loved us, the one who gave himself for us, the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. Focus on him and everything else loses its you, you, you stop focusing on everything. You can't see it like you used to see. You used to focus on your fears and focus on your financial problems and focus on uh, the anxieties of your life and focus on the doctor's report or focus on what's going on in the world through the news and the media today. But when you zero in, zoom in on Jesus. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 12? Fixing your eyes on him, the author and finisher of your faith. When you zoom in on him, everything else, you lose its focus, loses its focus, and you're no longer um, moved by that. You're no longer seeing all of that. You're no longer, it's there, but you're not focused on it. That's how life is supposed to be. Jesus said in Revelation 2, verse 4, I just have this against you that you've left your first love. Look at what he says. You have left your first love. Notice what he says. He tells us to return to our first love. Whenever something starts going wrong in our lives, he doesn't focus on what we do. He doesn't focus on, well, you did that, and if you would have done that, and if you would have done, you know how we are. We always tell people, well, you should have done this, and you should have done that. He says, look, I'm not going to focus on those things. There's just one thing. He said, I have this. This is the only thing that, I'm, that I have against you. You left your first love. You left your first love when you first got saved. You, you first fell in love with Jesus. What did you do? You worshiped him. You, I, this is what I did. I, I started to worship him. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't like one of these kind of worshipers that I would go to church and lift my hands like this. And I wasn't doing the, you know, the, 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 the Christian two-step. You know, I, didn't, I, I didn't do that right away. And I didn't lift my hands right away really high. You know, the first thing I did when I would see people praising and worshiping God, because I was really cool. You know, I had this black leather jacket and I thought I was cool. I, you know, I had really long hair, black leather jacket. And, um, and so when I first got saved, I was too cool for school, right? I was too cool to worship him like that, like a crazy guy, like I am now. But I learned it's cooler to worship than it is to try to just be cool. And so, but, so I started out like this. I started out like this. I started I start out like this. I, did you catch it? I started out like this. I just did that. Some of you got to see. You see this on the camera? I started out like this. I just did this. I just thought, once, once hey, that's all I can do. And I kind of did it kind of, you know, with, you know, looked around. Look around again a few months later. Sometimes I get them so high, but then people would look and I'd be like... I have no, I have no embarrassment anymore of worshiping God, of adoring him. I have no embarrassment to give. I have no embarrassment in giving my tithe and my offering. That's worship. I have no embarrassment in, in telling somebody about Jesus because that's worship. I'm worshiping him. You see, I'm not evangelizing I, I, love, I love the word evangelize, but, but that's really not the focus of the Bible to quote unquote evangelize. 
It's not, it's, that's not the word necessarily that, the, that, is the ma that matters most. It's, it's really to reflect the goodness of God to this world. It's, it's to reflect how good he is. It's to, it's to be a mirror. It's like when they see you. I'm not saying we're supposed to live our lives perfect so that they'll see perfection. It's not perfection. We want people to see grace when they look at our lives. We want people to see that God is big enough to have forgiven even somebody like me and that his forgiveness is greater than, than, than my sins. We want people to see, we want people to taste and see that the Lord is good. That in and of itself is the greatest form of evangelism that could be known to this world. You can convince somebody that Jesus is Lord and he's risen from the dead and he, then they ought to repent and they ought to get saved. You can convince somebody that, but if you can talk somebody into that experience, somebody else can just as easily talk them out of it. But when you meet Jesus like I did, when you met him like most of us did, when you see him for who he really is, there nobody can talk you out of that. Nobody can talk you out of that first love. He said, you've left your first love. He said, you left your first love. He said, that's the only thing I don't, I don't, I don't hold anything against you. But this one thing I have against you, you left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen. He doesn't say, remember your sins and repent of all those. He says in verse 5, remember from where you've fallen and go back to that. Amen. Go back to that. Repent of, 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 of falling out of love with Jesus. That's what he's saying to repent of. And then you'll do the first works. He said, that, he said your works will follow your love. Yeah. He, said, he said, return to your first love. He doesn't say return to your first religion. He doesn't say return to your first ritual. He says return to your first love and do the deeds. What will happen is you'll do the deeds that you did at first. When you return to that love, that kiss, that worship, that, that intimacy with God, what will happen is you will, you will do the works you did. You, you, will go, you will get back to sharing your faith, not because you have to, but because you're full of something. You're full of love and it just spills out. You're full of God's grace and it spills out. You see why we should be, the Bible says, eat. He said, he said, your body can be strengthened with food, but you need to be strengthened by grace. He said, your body is to be strengthened with food in Hebrews. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 12 or 13, your body is to be strengthened with food, but your heart is to be strengthened with grace. In other words, what we need to be eating, what, what our spirit and soul needs to be eating is the grace of God, the love of God. We need to be digesting how good God is and thinking on how good he is and meditating on how good he is, because then when you're full of that, that's what you end up talking about. When, you're, when you've tasted so much, about what God has done for you. And you don't have to, you don't have to ask God, oh God, do something for me that I could, that I can have something to talk about. It's if you just make a list, if you, I, we've had some people that have said they've made a list every day since we asked them, I encourage everybody a couple weeks, maybe three weeks ago to make a gratitude list. Just write down three things that you're thankful for each day. It doesn't take long and you don't have to make anything up. There's so much to thank God for that what ends up happening is as you begin to identify, whoa, he did this, and whoa, I have this in my life, and whoa, I have this in my life. I know there may be some things you don't have, but everything you don't have starts with what you do have. And it needs to start with gr gratitude for what you do have. And what happens is as you make that list, it makes you thankful. You don't make a list and say, okay, fine. I've made my list, now I'm gonna be thankful for that list. Okay, thank you God for this. And thank No, as you make the list, it causes you to be thankful. Because you begin to see, oh wow, he did that. It's what you're focused on. When you focus on the good God has done, you'll, you'll automatically become thankful. If you focus on what you don't have in your life, you will become a negative person. If you go over with me to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 10, remember in verse 40, Verse 38, 39, 40, 41. Because remember, Martha and Mary are sisters and their brother is Lazarus. And in Luke chapter 10, they invite Jesus over to their house. And Martha is distracted with all the things that she has to do 
for Jesus' appearance. She's focused on everything she has to do to please Jesus. Since he's over, you know how we are when we have somebody over and, and you want to make sure everything is right. You want to make sure everything's decorated right. You want to make sure the food is right. But, but to some, at some point, when it comes to Jesus, he doesn't need you to make sure everything's right. He's, he's already gone to great lengths to make sure everything's right by dying on the cross, by rising from the dead, by taking your sins, taking your sickness, taking your disease, taking everything from your life. He's taken it all on the cross, nailed all of your crap to the cross. Uh, am I in the right place here today? And, it, and, and, and so he doesn't need you to make everything right. So here Martha is like doing Jesus' work. Why so distracted, Martha? And that word distracted means to be dragged around in circles. It literally is translated. This word distracted. Martha was distracted in verse 40. It literally means she was, she was dragged around by life's circumstances. That's what the word distracted means. To be dragged around by life's circumstances. Where everything that happening in your life is just dragging you around. And you're just, you're just a slave to your circumstances. And she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care? Whoa. Problem number one, stop challenging whether God cares about, stop asking that stupidest question on earth. Don't you care? Don't you care? I'm freaking in your house, lady. What do you mean I don't care? Don't you care? I came down from heaven to this earth and I'm in your house sitting on your couch and I'm ready to eat your food, your deviled eggs or whatever you cooked. And you wonder if I care? Stop that nonsense. Don't you care? Don't you care? No, it's you're focused on the wrong stuff. He cares. He saved you. He, everything good in your life, he did it. What do you have in your life that God didn't give you? Well, you know, I'm kind of overweight, you know. Well, God, the Bible says that, the Bible says that those who are prosperous shall be made fat. And so I mean, so don't look at it all the wrong way. Okay. Lord, don't you care? My sister, you know, it's always somebody else causing you to feel the way you feel. How are you going to blame your distraction and your negativity and your disgruntledness on your sister? You're going to really ready? You're really going to blame it on your sister, your brother, this person or that person? We're always trying to find a scapegoat to blame while, why we are accusing God that he doesn't care. Why, I'm in this situation because of my sister. I'm in this situation because of her. Lord, why don't you care? She's left me here to serve alone. Therefore, tell her, tell her, to, tell her to help me. Okay, all right. You got it all wrong when you said Lord. And then you're going to have the audacity to say, tell her to help me. If he's Lord, you don't tell him what to do. You sit there and wait for your instructions because he is Lord. How dare we say, oh, remember that old song, old worship song we used to do, he is Lord, he is Lord. And maybe it wasn't quite like that, but it was something like that. Maybe it didn't <laughs> quite go like that. He is Lord, he is Lord. But you know what we sing? We change the words. You are Lord, you are Lord. And then God says, I want you to give. No, I won't. No, I won't. I want you to forgive that person. Heck no. Heck no. You are risen from the dead and you are... See, really? If he's Lord, stop. Okay, she did three things here. First, she, she questioned him caring. Number two, she blamed her emotional condition on her sister, her relative, her friend her neighbor, somebody, the pastor, whatever. Number three, she starts telling Jesus what to do. If you do this, then it'll make me feel better. And we got to stop telling God what to do to make us feel better. Because she's not, what does that reflect? All of those are the three things that begin to happen in your life when you're not worshiping Jesus. But what did Jesus say? Martha, verse 41, Martha Come on, look at what it says, verse 41. Jesus answers at her, Martha, Martha. Now, we read that and we, we think, oh, that's Jesus' eloquence and his British, you know, perspective. Martha, Martha. 
like he's being poetic. Martha, Martha. No, he called her once. She didn't listen. He called her again. You know how you are with your kids. Hey, 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 Bobby. Bobby! Like, Martha. Martha! Like, the first time he calls her, she's not paying any attention. He's got to call her twice, not because he's being poetic. Martha, Martha. Stop that. Stop reading the Bible like it's some sort of religious poetry. Martha, Martha. You're worried and troubled about so many things. No, it's Martha, no response. Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. Verse 42, watch this, here it is. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. What did she choose to do? To sit at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said to her, it will not be taken away from her. Because when you discover and when you choose, there's something here in this verse. She chose. Mary has chosen. There's one thing that is needed and Mary chose it. There's one thing in life that is needed, gang, and it's time for you to choose it. What did she choose in verse 38? It says Mary was sitting, verse, excuse me, verse 39. And what was Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. That's a choice. Once you taste and see the Lord is good, you need to make a life choice. A, a, a life-focused choice is I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him for the rest of my life. And what did Jesus say? There's only one thing that is needed. What is that one thing? Choose to sit at his feet and worship him. And what is worshiping him? In this case, listening to his words. What was Martha doing? Telling him, telling him her words that he, she wanted him to listen to. What was Mary doing? Listening to his words at his feet. That's worship. That's what we were born to do. And that's the one thing needed in life. You get a hold of this, everything's gonna be all right. Well, I know you're getting a hold of the end of religion, not the end of Christianity at all, but the end of this uh, religious effort to try to please God or to get God to love you or to get God to bless you. No, it's all a reflex. When you see what God's really like, what was the prayer Elisha prayed? He said, Lord, open the eyes of your servant that he may see. And then he opened his eyes and he saw all these chariots of fire surrounding them, protecting them. And it wasn't that God gave him those chariots of fire when he prayed. It's that God opened his eyes to see what was already his. When you see what God has already done for you, when you see what God is already like, when you see that God already loves you, man, it will produce this reflex of thanks and worship and praise so you can finally enjoy your relationship with God. Your struggle is over. God wants to reveal his goodness to you more than ever before. No more rituals, no more religion. It's time to really enjoy your relationship with God and enjoy your life. And I want to make sure you have that. I want you to have a free copy of this message in its entirety as my gift to you. So, um, so you can listen to it over and over again. So go to my website right now and you'll see a link to immediately download an audio copy to save to your computer, tablet, or any other device. But if you'd rather have a CD, just call the number on the screen and I'll mail one to you. Just let me know today that you want it. Check this out and I'll be right back. Religion has told us to do so many things in order to earn favor and love and prosperity from God. What if I told you you didn't have to do anything to experience the most incredible love imaginable? That's right, the end of religion. Pastor Gregory Dickow will show you how the daily and weekly rituals religion has told you you need to earn favor with God are holding you back from encountering a real and meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. This series is jam-packed, and each message will show you an exciting new way to encounter God's love and teach you how to experience God's amazing plan for your life. And Pastor Gregory Dickow's book, The Promises of Hope, in this amazing book, you'll learn about all of God's promises and plans for your life, plans for you to truly prosper. For your gift of only $19, Pastor Gregory Dickow's End of Religion Collection can be yours today. God has freely given you all His gifts because He just loves who you are. This collection will show you how to know God's grace and mercy so fully 
that it will radically change who you are and your entire life will change forever. Remember, 100% of your gift will be used to reach orphans, children, and the fatherless. Yes, 100%. Revival, restoration, and reformation will happen as we teach orphans, children, and the fatherless here and around the world to read at grade level, then making sure they each get their very own Bible, and finally, helping them to be planted in a local church. 100% of your gift today will be used to help Gregory Dickow reach children. Well, before I let you go, I just want to touch on one more thing. Our praise, our thanks, our worship towards God will always be a reflex instead of some Christian behavior that we've learned through religion. As you focus on seeing who God really is and what He's already done for you and what He's already given you, how much He loves you, You'll fall to your knees in thanks and praise. It'll be a reflex, not a ritual. Remember, Abraham fell down and worshiped God when he heard God speak to him about his promised blessing. It was a reflex. The wise men fell down in worship when they saw Jesus in the manger. It was a reflex, not a ritual. Peter fell down at Jesus' feet when he saw the goodness of God flood his boat with hundreds of fish. It was a reflex, not a ritual. Are you starting to see the pattern? When we see the goodness of God, the promises of God, and realize that He unconditionally loves us and promises to do us good all the days of our life, we will fall down and worship Him. I'll tell you what, this brings so much freedom to me and peace when you realize this. And that's why I want to put this teaching in your hand, the end of religion, the reflexes of grace. This is going to give you a picture of what God is really like, how good He really is. It will change everything in your life. It starts today. Make sure to get it. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that every person watching this broadcast right now will experience the opening of their eyes. Lord, open their eyes to see your goodness, your love, your kindness towards them. Let them see how, how deep and how vast, how wide, how broad your love is for them. Let it change them forever in Jesus' name. Now listen, thanks for watching. I believe you'll stop all these pointless rituals and trying to earn God's love and favor when you get a hold of the end of religion, it'll change your life forever. Now, don't miss our next broadcast. I can't wait to get into the Word of God with you. God loves you, and so do I, and I'll see you then. God bless. And we got a lot of depressed people in the world today, a lot of depressed Christians. Why? Because the very treasure that's inside of them is being buried by their worries and their fears and by their negativity and we need to uncover those treasures. How do we do that? The same way that God did it. We have this treasure in earthen vessels and what is that treasure? It's the ability to call light out of the midst of darkness and to speak light and to speak life over dark situations. How? By acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You got all that inside of you not to keep it down in there but to let it out and let it shine let it shine let it shine this program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and partners of Gregory Dickow Ministries